Thanks for joining us today at Harvest Christian Church. We pray the message is a blessing to you as you're going through whatever you are going through. I do encourage you to download our app or check out our website, harvestchristian.church. On that website, you can watch our messages. While you're watching the messages, send some comments or prayer requests. We'd love to pray for you. And you can also give online if you would like to bless this ministry as it's blessing you in return. I want you to know that you matter and you're valuable to God and to us at Harvest Christian Church. Have a great day. So here we are, we are in, we are in the book of Acts. Um, just to catch everyone up, as we walk through the book of Acts, what we have in, in Acts, um, this, is, this is the book that follows the gospels. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the story of Jesus's life, right? As he was here on earth. And so at this point in Acts, Jesus has lived, He's died, he's resurrected, and then he's come to, the, he's come to the, um, the other apostles and come to all the other disciples and told them, hey, I have, a special, I have a special job for you. I'm going back to heaven. I'm leaving you here. You're supposed to start something called the church. You see, the, the church is the bride of Christ. The church is also inscribed, described in the Bible as the, as the body of Christ. The local church, like what we're meeting at right now, this is God's plan A, it's God's plan B, it's God's plan C, and all the way through Z. He has no other plan. His plan is for people like us to gather once a week, to gather to be encouraged, and to scatter and share the word of God. That, that's his plan. It's the only plan he has. And he says, it's going to work because my Holy Spirit is going to empower you to do so. And so he promised his Holy Spirit to come, that great thing's happening. We've walked through Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 at a slow pace. We have been in Acts chapter 9. We'll be finishing Acts chapter 9 today. And we've been learning about a guy named Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was this man who was, who was very much a Jewish man, believed in God of the Old Testament, but did not believe Jesus was the Messiah, was the Son of God. He was part of the group that probably pushed to have Jesus killed. He has now been part of the group who has been persecuting the Christians. He's had some put to death. He's hunted them down. Now, on, on the way to Damascus, Paul has this experience with God. He gets knocked off his feet and sees, hears, is blinded, and God, Jesus himself, speaks to him. In the process, Saul now is converted. He went from being a person who didn't believe in Jesus and was persecuting anyone who believed to a person who absolutely believes in Jesus and is sharing his faith everywhere he goes. This is the Apostle Paul. He's been transformed by Jesus. So in verse 31, we pick up, Joe did a great job reading this. He says, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace. What's that word right there? Say peace. Oh, doesn't peace sound nice? They had peace, being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and the church increased in numbers, okay? So what we have here is this is like God giving us a status of the work. It's like, where are we at? This is the job status thing. Where are we at right now? So first he lists some different regions that churches had been planted now they're healthy. Now these churches are prospering, okay? Here's just a picture of, of Israel here on the bottom. Here we have Judea in the light blue. In the middle, we have Samaria, like in that purplish blue color. And then up top, we have pink. That's the Galilee, okay? Now we know Judea, G Jerusalem's down here. See a Galilee up here in, in, um, in, in Galilee. And that's where we find most stuff. Samaria was kind of that land of, of a forgotten. Nobody passed through it. As a matter of fact, good Jews when they went from Judea to Galilee, would come over here into a whole different country and travel up and go, not to foot, step mark, foot on Samaria because they thought it'd make it unclean, all right? But what's happened here is the gospel has been preached and churches have been planted in Judea, in Galilee, and even in Samaria. And we read that with Philip and what he's doing, okay? So even though all this has happened, we have this apostle Paul who was the chief persecutor of the church, Right? He gets converted, and you think that would mean things would change, but they didn't. As soon as Saul was converted, more persecutors, actually more in number than before because they weren't following one leader. We have numerous leaders. Persecution broke out like we had never seen before and maybe have never seen in this world. Persecution of the Christians, persecution of the church, people dying, people going to jail, man, woman, child alike. But yet, what did that verse 31 say? Even though it's all this persecution is going on, the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had, what's the word? Peace. Interesting word when you talk about 
persecution. You see, at this point, the church was not only continuing, but the church was strong. Even though, despite the great opposition and persecution that came against it, it it was strong. Now, I I really don't title my sermons, okay? I don't spend my creative energy on doing stuff like that because I don't know if it sticks. Usually, my sermons are like titled like Acts 9, 31 through 43. That's what I titled it. But this one, I saw something I thought was pretty simple. Um, Most people maybe don't see this as they read through it, but I saw four miracles that happened in this passage we're going to read today. Miracle number one is the strong and growing church despite significant opposition. The church had was strong, was growing, was peaceful, even though we had opposition. Now, that seems contrary to our thoughts, doesn't it? We would think as a church, as we're going, if all of a sudden strong opposition, if outside forces came in and started persecuting and taking our men, women, and children to jail, we would be quieter. We would be silent. We would take a break from the season of work just to be safe. But throughout history, that's not been the case. The greater the threat, the greater the grace of God was preached. The greater the threat, the more the church stepped forward. The church rises up at this point, and they they work, they do the work of God, and they do it with great effectiveness, even though their lives are in danger. Now, now we understand this because we're a country that's founded on this very principle. Because of a very difficult situation that was oppressing us, our country stepped out and acted and brought freedom. The same happen happens in our lives. Some people just eat healthy because they want to. You are a special breed, by the way. Most people eat healthy because they have a medical situation. They, have, they eat healthy because the doctors told them to. They exercise because they have to or things are going bad. We understand that when opposition, persecution, stress comes in our life, many times it brings out the healthiest attributes of us, right? We step forward into it. So despite the circumstances, they're all depending on on God like they never have before. And because of that, God is doing great things. You know, throughout the book of Acts, we don't even really hear about that Galilee up top. We don't even really hear about any of the churches being planted in Galilee. But this verse tells us that it's happening. In other words, God was doing so much more than than is recorded in the book of Acts. Don't take the book of Acts like this exhaustive um, history. This is just a quick little snapshot. And I love this, that God is doing so much more than we even saw. Now, as we talk about that word peace, how can peace come in persecution? Well, peace doesn't mean the persecution stopped. It didn't. What it means is there is a peace that's greater than world peace. Did you hear me? There's a peace that's greater than world peace. There's a peace that's greater than peace and quiet. There's a peace that's greater than peace in the home. And so with that said, let's go here. Don't wait until everything is good in your life before you have peace. Or it'll never happen. If you're waiting for life to be put together, life to be easy for you to find the peace that God has given us through his Holy Spirit, through the surrendering and through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, if you're waiting for for everything to be good in your life to find peace, you'll never find it. But if you can find peace when life seems hectic at at the best, it is there you'll find joy, you'll find hope. You need to be like the early church the peace of God in the midst of our difficulties. I want to hit on a couple phrases here in verse 31. It said that the church was being built up and they were walking in, what's that say in the, in the bluish purple? Fear of the Lord and in the... And they increased in numbers. I want to focus on those two things, the fear of the Lord and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so these two, these two components are essential for us as a congregation. We need to fear the Lord to be an effective and healthy congregation. We need to have comfort from the Holy Spirit to be an effective and healthy congregation. But these are also true for the individual lives. Us as a whole, it's true. Each of us individually, we need to fear the Lord to be healthy and effective. And we need to have the comfort of the Holy Spirit in the same way. Fear of the Lord. I I can't tell you how important this is. 
But I can't tell you how frustrating it is to me as I look across our nation to see how many congregations don't fear our God. I can't tell you how frustrating it is as I, as I meet people who claim to love Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but yet don't have a fear of the Lord. When we truly have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ, there should be a, a, there should be a sense of a appropriate fear. There should be a sense of reverence. There should be a sense of honoring God. And to me, it's, it's, it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking that it's not there. It's shocking that we all, we all think that when we sin and we just think nothing of it, except that good thing I have God, the cosmic magic eraser of my sins. Oh, I messed up again. You could think God already knew I was going to do that. He's going to forgive me. And there's, there's truth in that because that's called grace where God forgives us, whatever. But if we come to God flippant like that, what father in their right mind we say, oops, sorry, wreck the car again, Dad. Hope you get a new one. Can you give me a new one? Who, what father in their right mind is going to be okay with that? What father in their right mind is not going to come across and say, yes, I still love you, but son, where is the respect? Where is the fear? We, we know we shouldn't do that sin. We know it. But where's the fear of the Lord? Where is it? I when I sinned, I just didn't sin against my brother or sister in the world. When I sinned, that was in direct opposition to the God of heaven, the creator of all things. Where's the fear of the Lord? Where is the sense that there really is a God and he is really real and that he seriously loved you and he legitimately died for you for that sin? Do you think we should take us? If I took my son and had him die for you for something you did and then you made light of what you're doing, do you think I'm happy about my sacrifice I made? Why would we think God would be any other why do we take our sin and just all flip it and just loose with it? We, he died for us. It, it matters that you please God. It matters. It matters that we take this seriously. It matters when we offend God. He is holy and righteous and just. And the just thing to do to me when I flip it with my sin is to discipline me. That's the right thing, the just thing to do to me. It matters when we offend him. It matters when we disobey him. And it matters how we come to him. Fear God. Don't be like in fear, like, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? Fear him in such a way of like, I have broken relationship, God. I'm gonna step into it. I'm gonna own my actions. I'm gonna beg you for mercy. When I was a kid, there was a phrase that was used. I was thinking about and when I wrote this sermon. I'm like, I haven't heard that phrase used for a long time. Remember when we used to refer to people as God-fearing men? God-fearing women. I can't tell you the last time I heard that. Because we just think God is this, is this like this, like, like we are, it, it's, he is so, he is so blessed to have me. I bet he's so grateful that I asked for forgiveness. I bet God is happy with me. What are we talking about? Who are we serving? That sounds like, that's not the kind of God I serve. I serve a, I serve a mighty God, a powerful God. And me as a man, I should be a God-fearing man. And people should look at me and say, you know what? He does the right thing because he fears God. He respects God. And same thing with you ladies in the same way. God-fearing, God-chasing. That was a person who believed there was a God in heaven and cared about how they lived. There is a God in heaven, and he does care how you live. The second phrase that we see there is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting how he brings one after the other because, you know, if we really fear the God, we need the second. If we really understand who we are in connection with God, we need someone to cover us because we will be shaking our boots, 
right? We'll, we'll, it'll, be, it'll be a hard thing. God doesn't want us to just fear him. He wants us to experience his comfort and his Holy Spirit, experience his help in our life as well. He says, hey, I don't want you just to be there by yourself. I don't want you to be like, oh man, I, I, I stink as a human. I keep making mistakes. He's like, no, 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 wait a second. Let me give you my spirit so you can feel my strength, so you can feel my hug, so you can feel my love in your life, so you can know that you really do matter in me. You don't just matter when you do good. You matter at all times. That's why God died and gave his Holy Spirit to us. Wouldn't it be good if we would diagnose one another like this? If you come up to me and say, Mike, you know what? You really look like you're comforted by the Holy Spirit right now, but when I see you, you're really not fearing God. You're not taking church seriously. You're not taking leading your wife and your kids seriously. You're not, taking, you're not taking your generosity seriously. I see you just flippantly laying around with your words and your actions coming out of your mouth. Mike, brother, fear God. And when you come and fear God, know that the Holy Spirit will comfort you. Wouldn't that be good if we could do that one? Or wouldn't it be good if all of a sudden it's like I see one of my Christian brothers who really fears God and he's just beating himself up. I'm like, wait a second. I know where you're at, but know that God loves you. Let me be, let me be comforted right now. Yes, you've beat yourself up. Okay, God never leaves you there. God wants to restore you. He has hope for you. You are his child. You have been, you have been beautifully and wonderfully made and he saved you. You need the comfort of the Holy Spirit now. The church used to say phrases like this, that the church used to say their job was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. We get afraid of that phrase now, but the comfort of the afflicted is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We as our job should come and show the Holy Spirit comfort, but also when somebody's sitting there and just living flippantly, we should come and put the pressure and say, the whole God is a reverent God. We should do this. Verse 31 is a beautiful verse. Let's read it again. So the church throughout, so, so the church throughout all Judea and Samaria and Galilee and Samaria had peace, being built up and walking in the fear of the God. They're walking in it. In the fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, they increased in, they increased in number. That's why. Because they feared God and were comforted by the Holy Spirit. Miracle number two, not only a strong, growing church despite opposition, but now we see the healing of Aeneas, okay? All right, Aeneas, all right? And Aeneas is a great name, right? I'm so glad I have Joe read these things before because I'm sure he studied it and I just say it, okay? All right, so it's, it's great. It's right. Here we go, verses 32 through 35. As Peter was traveling from place to place, he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda, okay? Verse 33, there, were, there he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. That doesn't sound like a good life. What happens? Peter said to him, to Aeneas, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, say the words Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, make your bed. That's what I tell my kids every morning. It's biblical. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. So all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to, turned to who? Turned to Peter? No, turned to who? The Lord. You know why they turned to the Lord? Because Peter made all about Jesus. And that's why. It's interesting because now we focus, we spit, there's a big shift here. We're all on about Saul of Tarsus. We had this big shift back to Peter. Peter, one of the apostles, one of Jesus' closest friends. And the trend here is going to be in the book, rest of the book of Acts is we're going to spend about I want to spend a little time, like the next, this chapter, the rest of this chapter, and all of next with Peter, and then we're going to go and see the Apostle Paul for the rest of the book. The previous patterns of the apostles, after Jesus had, has, had ascended, and the church was, 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 was um, scattered all over because of the persecution, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. But now Peter seems to understand Jesus' command. Remember in Acts 1.8? He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, doing that. Judea, not so well. Samaria, not really doing that. And to the ends of the earth. And it seems that all of a sudden that Peter and the other apostles, as we read through other books of the Bible, are starting to get it right now. They're not just staying with their families in Jerusalem. 
They're also scattering out. Now Peter has traveled, and he traveled some 35 miles down here in the green, under the green underline is Jerusalem. Okay, up here is, is Lydda in the yellow. So it's about 35 mile um, travel that he went to this, this place. And um, remember, Peter has a, has a, has a wife. He likely at this point, I many historians think he has kids at this point. So when he's going, it's not just 35 miles and a 35 minute drive. You know, he's walking. He's going to spend days, weeks there. He's going from his, from his family to do this. And he goes there. And I think 32, verses 32 and 33 is an interesting pattern. Because what we see here is for all of his life, Peter was comfortable watching for his life, but with his family. And here Peter has to get out of his comfort zone. He doesn't just get to be in his own little protective circle that he liked anymore. Now he has to get out of that circle and start doing ministry to people he doesn't know that may not accept him. And he has to start spreading the gospel. And so while he's out there preaching the gospel, spreading the gospel outside of his comfort zone, he finds a man who needed help. Now let's look at verses 32 and 33 again. As Peter was traveling, he's just traveling place to place. He wasn't going to find Aeneas, okay? He also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda, next town on the road. Hey, here's Lydda. Let's stop here. Tell him about this. Talk to the church that's been planted here. There he found a man named Aeneas and who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. And here's the truth, guys. When we get out of our comfort zones and we begin to do ministry, so many people are like, I, I just don't see the hand of God at work in my life. <laughs> if you're comfortable all the time, I understand why. If you want to see the miracles and the ministry of God at work doing amazing things, get out of your comfort zone and do things for the name of Jesus Christ in your community and all over the world, and you will see God do amazing, unusual things. This is why so many people talk about the remarkable demonstrations of God's power when they go on mission trips, because you're out of your comfort zone, you're doing God's work, and God loves to show off in those situations. I think this is an experience you can have. If you'll just set aside time in your life and preach the word of God, I think you'll see God work. If you'll set aside your, your grip on your resources and use those for the kingdom of God, I, I think you'll see God doing work. I, I think if you'll set aside your interests and what you love to do for hobbies and put God first, I think you'll see God doing work in your life and the good chance that God will do it in an amazing way. But you're going to have to choose to put God first. You don't even have to go. This can happen right here in Superior, Nebraska. If you don't see the people that need love, that need the love of God here in Superior, you're living in a special place of comfort. It's called blindness, spiritual blindness. And we think, well, if I do that, how much of my time is it going to take? As much as the Lord says is needed. Because I'm not in charge of my time. That is the Lord's time that he has granted me. It's what we have to do. Look at verse 34. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Notice that Peter right away gives credit to and glory to Jesus. Everyone say the name Jesus. I think it's so important we say that name. Get it used to coming off your, out of your mouth because you need to say it in, in this community more. There's a direct difference between the way Jesus did miracles and how Peter does miracles, isn't there? You notice it? Jesus, when he did such miracles, it was on his own authority. By, by my name, by the power invested in me, by, by me as the son of God, you are healed. But Peter did all the miracles he did who were very intentionally under the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, never underneath his name. Saying, I have no healing. I have no power in myself. It all comes from Jesus. Not about Mike, not about Peter, not about anyone else. It's all about the name of who? Jesus. Now look at Peter's directive in verse 34. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Good news. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. Now, that sounds really awesome, right? But when I read that, I had this weird like, ooh. It sounded very, very, very familiar. 
You remember Jesus was doing ministry and he's in this house and all the people are crowding around and he's, and he's preaching at this house and there's so much room, so many people there that people couldn't get to Jesus. And these friends brought this guy on this mat and they couldn't get to Jesus. So they're like, what do we do? So they go around, they climb up on top of the roof of the house that Jesus is preaching in. They tear away the roof of the house and they lower the man down. They lower him down and the friends say, Jesus, heal him partly because they want him healed, partly because they don't want to pull him back up. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Um, and Jesus says, Jesus looks at the man, and he doesn't heal him. He says, your sins are forgiven, right? This causes this huge uproar amongst the, amongst the religious leaders, and how can he say the sins are forgiven? Only, the, only God can do that. So Jesus says, how about I tell you this? How about I say, get up, make your bed, and walk? It seems to me that, G, that Peter here, the words of Jesus are in his head and in his heart. And as he walks up to a lame man that couldn't walk, the thing that he couldn't get out of his mind is what Jesus not only had done, but the promise that Jesus had given. When you are preaching, my spirit, my helper will bring the words to you, will bring you to remember what I need you to say. And he says the words almost identical to what Jesus says. Not ironic, not by chance. Because he was doing ministry in the name of Jesus, so he's going to speak as Jesus did. Because Jesus was working through his life. It seems to me the words of Jesus were echoing when he, in his mind when he looked at Aeneas and said these words. Now look at verse 35. So all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him, the Aeneas, and turned to the Lord. the miraculous healing accompanied by the preaching of the gospel brought glory to God and many turned their lives to him. I've said it many times and I say it many more. Whenever something great happens in your life, the miracle always leads to the message. And you're like, well, I haven't had any miracles. Oh, yes, you have. What is the joy of your life today? It's a miracle that God brings good to your life. This world is a fallen world. This world is falling apart. Everything else here dies. When something good comes to you, that is a miracle. And so when the miracle of God comes on your life, does the message of Jesus Christ come out of your mouth? Because that's what needs to happen. The miracle is always there to lead to the message. That's what happens here. All right. Now, miracle number three. So first we have a strong growing church despite significant opposition. That's a miracle. And we have a healing of a guy. That's a miracle. Now we have the raising of a dead lady. Okay, verses 36 through 38. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. One laugh right now, so get out of our system. All the junior high boys out there, come on. All right, she was always doing good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became sick and she died. After washing her, they placed her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, huh, Lydda, who was there? Peter. The disciples heard that Peter was there and sent two men to, to him and begged him, don't delay in coming with us. Okay, so here's the map again. We're down here to green, Jerusalem is where Peter started. Go up here to yellow, Lydda, and over here to, to the pinkish, fuchsia, purplish, whatever it is, Joppa, okay? All right, over there, that's what we have next, okay? So that's where that, just this little, this, this little trek from Lydda to, to Joppa is where they, where they went here. So some Christians from Joppa come to find Peter, and they don't wait. And they tell him, Peter, please don't wait. Our sweet Tabitha is sick. She was so loved by her friends that they called her Dorcas. Not a biblical name that, that, that made the list for our baby girl, by the way. Tried. I tried. Okay, very biblical. But Tabitha, the word Dorcas, everything, it means somebody that's really loved and, and, and matters and, 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 and sincere in, in their community. Tabitha was deeply loved by her community. Why? Look at verses 30, verse 36. Because she was always doing good works and acts of charity. She was always doing good works and acts of charity. Not only was she full of good works and acts of charity, not only did she think about them, not only did she, not only did she have good ideas, what did she do? She did it. She did it. That's a good application for us today. If God puts good works and charitable deeds in your mind or your heart, how about you do them? 
So many times you're like, oh, this is a great idea. I'm going to tell the church, so maybe they'll do it. How about you do it? How about you? Oh, I don't have time. Whoa. Let's take a step back again. Fear of God. Whose time is it? Fear of God. Why did you have that idea? Who else would give you that? We as humans don't think about how to serve other people. That is the goodness of God in our lives. He has called you. Now you should be obedient. We should step forward and say, I don't have time. Well, that means something else has to be cut to do what God asked you to do because it is God's time, not your own. It's why it's so important for us to be at church. So often we don't have the fear of God in our life. We don't respect it. And we're just like, oh, I had something else come up. Why would you have something else come up if you truly fear and honor God? It's why things struggle with our giving. Why would something else trump the giving to the Lord? Why would something else trump your time you give to the Lord? Why would, why would being with family? Why would being with friends? Why would, why would chasing kids to sporting events? Why would that trump the time that is, that is set apart for Christians to come together for the Lord? When are we as Christians going to say, I am a man who fears the Lord and I will remain upright with him. So some Christians come to Joppa and they find him. And there it is. And this is, this is the Tabitha. This is who Tabitha was. She was one who did charitable deeds and good works. She was loved by her Christian community and she unexpectedly died. And they were crushed and they're grieved by it. They needed a Tabitha. Everyone needs a Tabitha in their life. And they thought to themselves, Peter's not far away. Let's go get Tabitha or go get Peter for Tabitha in verse 39 and 40. So Peter got up. He didn't delay. And he went with them. And when he arrived, they led him to the room upstairs. And all the widows approached him, weeping. That makes sense. But here's the other part. It also makes sense, but it doesn't make sense to us men. Showing him the robes and clothes that Tabitha Dorcas had made while she was with them. Look at the pot holder that Tabitha gave me. Look at this. Remember when Tabitha cursed this? Oh my goodness, what is going on here? Guys, are you with me? You're like, what is that? And all you ladies are like, of course you did. I remember her. Oh my gosh. All right. And then Peter sent them all out of the room and he knelt down and he prayed and turning toward the body, he said, Tabitha, get up. Like, that's going to work. She opened her eyes, saw Peter and sat up. Whoa. He gave her his hand. Gentlemen. And he helped her stand up. Then he called the saints and widows and presented her how? Alive. Alive. That's what it says. What an amazing picture. They, they went to get Peter, hoping he could help. We don't know what they were hoping for. Maybe they were so grieved that they just wanted him to be with them. That they were so grieved they didn't know what to do and they needed somebody that everyone was such hysterics and didn't know what to do. They needed some way to come in and say, here's the hope of God in this awful situation. Maybe you wanted somebody to encourage them and show them the word of God. Because remember, this is a brand new, a brand new church. It had been around for maybe a year or so. Maybe. So brand new church, never heard about Jesus before. Maybe this needs someone to come in and teach God's word and all this. Now, let me say this. I'm going to say it clear. I'm going to say it twice, and I want you to hear it loud and clear here. There is zero. There is no indication in the book of Acts, zero, none, that it was common for people to be raised from the dead. There is no indication. Let me say it again. There is no indication in the book of Acts that it is common for people to be raised from the dead. There is no indication in the book of Acts that it would be commonly expected that the apostles or anyone else would raise somebody from the dead. There is no, there is no indication. This miracle is listed in the book of Acts. You know why? Because it was unusual and remarkable. Likely, they did not come to get Peter to heal Tabitha from the dead. We saw that she was raised. We saw it happen somewhere else. So we just think that's the way it was. No, likely they were coming because they didn't know what else to do. They were so emotionally and spiritually distraught. Do I believe that God could do something like this? Absolutely. Do I believe that God could raise somebody from the dead today? A hundred percent. But hear me out here. I also believe there is a depressing amount of hype and gullible blind belief in every author or podcast that says such things happen. And we should be really careful. There are people in this life, in this world that lie for their own personal gain. And though I believe God can do whatever he so desires, if I heard such things, I would not accept them gullibly without testing it and examining it. 
me give you an example. I mean, you might not know this about me, but one time I, I, somebody actually started saying in a community I lived in that I had raised somebody from the dead. True story. True story. I lived in Wyoming. There was a really bad car accident. I was the first one there, and I was I was CPR and everything tested, you know, trained and, and um and first aid trained. And so I was the first one there, and this person was hurt really bad, and they were out. Okay, so I checked, had a pulse, were breathing a little bit. They were knocked out, and so I just started praying. There's nothing else to do. I just started praying, and so when the medics come, they see me bent over the person, think I know them, and weeping, and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, see the person lifeless, and they haven't got there yet. And all of a sudden, I pray, and I see somebody. I say, in Jesus' name, Amen. I say it out loud, and as I did that, exactly the same time, the person exhaled and started having movement. Okay. One medic swore that I rose that person from the dead. I was fully aware, and I knew the person was alive the whole time. I actually had to make an article in the newspaper to, to say, hey, you heard this? Not true. The guy was alive. I was just praying, and they woke up at the same time. God, give you the glory for his life, but not happen. See how things can happen? We can do something, and even it wasn't even myself, somebody else takes and runs with it. So God can do miraculous things today. Not every report is accurate. Not every report is honest, and not every important, and not every report has a good intention. Okay? But whether the people anticipated it happening or not, here's the truth that happened. So Peter goes all in. He goes all in showing, he goes, shows all the, all the, he shows the widow, goes in, the widows are showing him the blankets and the, and the, and the, and the, and the pot holders that Tabitha crocheted him. And then Peter asked him to leave the room. I, I tell you, all of a sudden reading this, I'm like, I got that same feeling again. It sounds so familiar. You remember when Jesus was doing ministry and he's walking from town to town? And all of a sudden, Jesus is approached by this ruler of this ruler, this ruler, and he said, "My daughter is sick. Come with me now." Jesus begins to go, and before they get to the house, some of the servants came out and say, "Don't don't trouble the master because your daughter died." Remember that? Remember that story? And then in Matthew five, chapter thir- chapter five, thirty eight through forty two. It says, they came to the leader's house. This is the story of Jesus. And he, Jesus, was, was, saw the commotion and people were weeping. Sound familiar? And people were wailing because the little girl died. Of course they were. He, he went in and said to them, why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they started laughing at him. They went from weeping to laughing. And he put them all outside. All of a sudden I was like, Whoa. And then he took the child's father and mother, which is good, and those who were with him. You know who that was? Peter. And he entered the place where the child was. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kume, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was 12 years old. At this, they were utterly Astounded. Now, the phrase that Peter uses here, remember in chapter four, in verse 40 of chapter nine of Acts, then Peter said all the way down here, he said, Tabitha, get up. Remember that phrase? Now, in the Greek, we're going to go Greek on you real quick, but please, it's going to make, make a lot of sense. It, this, this phrase, Tabitha, get up, in the Greek is Tabitha, kume. And the phrase that Jesus used was Talitha, kume. One letter. It was almost like when, G, when Peter heard the word Tabitha, even though everyone else called her Dorcas, what did, Tab, what did they call her? What did he call her? Tabitha. It's like he remembered the words in his mind as he spoke to Jesus for Tabitha. Jesus. Tabitha. Peter was simply trying to do as Jesus did. Jesus was his leader. Peter wasn't trying to lead Jesus anymore. Hear my words here. His time, Peter decided to let Jesus lead him. Peter before was saying, Jesus, don't go to the cross. Peter said, Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem. Peter says, Jesus, don't wash my feet. Jesus, Peter says, Jesus, stay up here on the mountain. Peter says, Jesus, let's take over the world. And now Peter is done trying to lead Jesus. And now he's allowing Jesus to lead him. And here's my question for you. Friends, are you done trying to lead Jesus in your life? Are you done trying to tell Jesus how to work in your life, what to do with your life, what your time should look like, what your relationships should look like, what your money should look like, what your free time should look like? Are you done trying to tell Jesus how he's gonna work in your life? And are you willing to allow Jesus to lead you? That's good stuff. Hard to apply, but good stuff. 
And my question is, would you make that decision today? No, I'm done telling Jesus what to do in my life. I'm done telling him what I have time for and what I don't have time for. I'm done. I'm going to let you, Jesus, and your word lead me. Verses 40 and 41. Then Peter sent them all out of the room. He knelt down, prayed, turning toward the body and said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes and saw Peter and stood up and sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her stand. Then they called all the, what's that word there? Saints. Called all the saints and the widows, and presented her alive. This is a remarkable, incredibly unusual miracle, things God can still do, but we should never go away accept, accept such things. Now, let me clarify some words here. Tabitha was, a resurrect, was not resurrected. Tabitha was resuscitated, okay? When, when, you are, when you are resuscitated, you come back to life in the same body you died in. When you're resurrected, you come back to life in a new body that will never die again. That's the difference. She came back into the same life. She's just, she just resuscitated. She's going to die again. This is what's going to happen. Something else I want to point out. Here, God raised Tabitha from the dead. And we're like, whoa, yeah, God, powerful. But just a few chapters earlier, a guy named Stephen, who was preaching the gospel in a mighty way, died defending the gospel heroically and remained dead. I'm sure people grieved Stephen. I'm people, sure people mourned Stephen. I'm sure people prayed for Stephen. I'm even positive Peter was there mourning Stephen. But Stephen remained dead. Why? You know, in just a couple chapters, we're going to read that the apostle James, the first apostle, dies. And guess what he did? He remained dead. Why? Well, a couple things first to look at here. Things that support, that things, th two things that support. God has unknowable ways to us. We, we don't understand. God may choose to bring people back to life and resuscitate them on this earth. They may remain dead. There, there's no reasoning. We can't say Tabitha is more important than Stephen. The answer is God knows what he's doing and we don't. The second thing is Stephen and James were not re resuscitated, but they were resurrected. Remember that? Jesus tells us when we get in heaven, what do we get? Our resurrected body. And say, everyone say resurrected body. Resurrected body. And, and tell me what, tell me what's better. Tell me what's better to come back into this body that's going to die again and resuscitate it or to be with Jesus in a resurrected body will never die. I mean, we celebrate God raising Tabitha from the dead and we're like, oh man, it sucks he didn't raise Stephen. No, no, Stephen didn't think that. Stephen had no thought, but as soon as he died and he got to heaven, he's like, this is the best day ever. Praise God, I died, so I get to be here. But we think the exact opposite. We're always mourning the death, but we're forgetting the resurrection. We're forgetting the resurrected body. Which is better, heaven or earth? Tell me, which is better? Should we as Christians not celebrate our loved ones? Resurrection? Can I be clear with you here? Should we not fight the gates of hell for our friends' souls if they don't know him? Here's the truth for all of us who have not died to this point. We're not here for our own sake. We've been given a new life, a new opportunity for life, and the reason for that is because God has a plan for you. You are here today because God still has a plan for you. Work the plan. Now look at something in verse 41. He gave her his hand and helped her stand up. Then he called the saints and the widows and presented her alive. This is the first time Christians are called saints in all the Bible. You are. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and are submissive to him, following him, living for Christ, you are a saint. If you've been born again, converted by the Holy Spirit, given your life to obey and serve Jesus Christ as your commanding offer, the Bible, Jesus would call you a saint. Saint doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you're set apart. That when the world looks at you, they realize you're different. You're distinctive by God for his purpose. You are truly a man or a woman who fears the Lord. Verse 42. This became known throughout Joppa and many believed in, and believed in the Lord. Same thing here. Because of Peter's words, people came not to Peter. They weren't following Peter, but followed Jesus. So far, we looked at strong and growing church despite opposition, the healing of Anus, Aeneas, and then also the raising of Tabitha. And my last one, because I'm not creative, the fourth miracle is verse 43. So I didn't know how to say it. 
You don't read this like, what kind of miracle is that? Look at this. And Peter stayed on, stayed on many days in Joppa with Simon and Leather Tanner. Amazing, isn't it? Dead people raised to life. People were paralyzed, back walking. Opposition, persecution comes. The church is going strong. And Peter stayed in Joppa with a guy named Simon. Hang with me here. Peter um, never intended to go to Joppa, did he? He was in Lydda and was called to Joppa for the healing of Tabitha. It was not on his agenda. Then he decides to stay in Joppa. How long? Many days. With who? A guy named Simon. Maybe you're like, oh, he stayed with Simon because his name's Simon? Mm, I think it's different. I think the last part, the miracle is this last part, a leather tanner. You're like, uh, what's the big deal here, Mike? Okay. Well, that decision would have been shocking to any observing Jew of that time. They would have been like, you could stay anywhere and you're going to stay there? Why would you stay there? I thought Peter, I thought, even though Peter gave his life to the Lord, he was still following Jewish custom in many ways. I mean, he, he knows, I, I know he follows Jesus, but I thought, still thought he would stay clean and observe the laws of, laws of Moses. So why is he staying there? According to Jewish interpretation of the law at that time, it was strictly forbidden to associate with anyone who routinely worked with dead animals. A tanner takes an animal, takes the fur, the hide off of it, and works with it. You're working with, that's all you do, is work with dead animals. According to the law, a tanner had, at least, had, to, had to live at least 75 feet outside of the village because their job caused continual ritual uncleanliness. And Peter chooses to stay of all places with him. As a matter of fact, did you know if you got engaged and then married a tanner and found out they were a tanner afterwards, you had right for divorce immediately with no, with no repercussions? This is significant because our next passage in Acts chapter 10 is maybe the most thrilling passage in the whole book of Acts. And you're like, Mike, you say that every time, but it's true. If you want, if you think the conversion of Paul was exciting in Acts chapter 9, wait till you see the conversion of Peter in Acts chapter 10. Like, wait a second, Peter, I knew you. No, wait, wait till you see his conversion. See, Saul was converted from being a persecutor to a follower of Jesus. We love it. We celebrate that. People were far off from God coming to God. But Peter was somebody who had followed God, was with Jesus. And all of a sudden, Acts chapter 10, he is going to be converted from his ritual, religious traditionalism. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Reggie, Right? We're all in trouble here because Peter, what he's going to be converted from is the whole idea of here's how it's always been. I don't like it that way. That's not the way I want it. This isn't the way I want to. And he went from all being about him to now all being about spreading the name of Jesus to anyone just to get one more to know Jesus. I don't care what it does on this side of sin. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get one more to Jesus. That's the conversion of Peter. It's beautiful. It's been beautiful, beautiful when God converts those who are far from him. But it is a bigger miracle, in my opinion, when he converts us old crotchety ones that we think we got all figured out to this point and we think we can trust God and we think we've done all of our life this way and now the new the new way comes in we're like wait a second I don't like it that way and I'm like whoa wait a second I thought it was about Jesus and not about us and this is the conversion of Peter it's so amazing it starts right here and Peter's saying you know what nowhere does it say that I can't stay with a tanner in the Bible that is a tradition that you added to the word of God. And being able to discern between what is tradition and what is a command of God is essential in our Christian walk. And it's often, I gotta tell you what, most things that divide churches are not the word of God. They are the traditions of man. And it's sad. Everything we do should come, should serve a purpose, a very useful purpose. Everything we should do in the church should serve a purpose for the kingdom of God, for the expansion of the kingdom of God. And Peter understood this. It was a miracle that he was willing to stay at the house of Simon the Tanner. Can I, can I point one more thing out? Notice something else really amazing about this. When did Peter choose to do this? He didn't show up at night and stay with them and get out before everyone not saw. It was right after he did a miracle. Everyone was watching the guy. I'm going to tell you is this. Don't hide from the work of God. Don't worry about what your reputation will be. Serve God first. So here we are. The work of God in Peter's heart 
laid the groundwork for what God would do in the following chapter. Here's a sneak peek. What God is going to do through a life-changing work in Peter is going to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. That's anyone that's not a Jew. The gospel that he has brought to them was a simple message. Jesus died on the cross for you too to rescue you. 